Awesome. So this morning we're going to walk through chapter 3 in the book of Daniel. So if you guys want to start turning there, if you're not already there, uh, that would be great. But what I'd like to do first is start with a little bit of background. Um, let's see how we got to Daniel, uh, what's happening in Israel, and why they are in Babylon. So Daniel was one of the captives from Judah, taken away and brought to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. And for years and years, prior to this time, God's chosen people, Israel, who God had rescued from Egypt and made them into a nation, had chosen to rebel and go after other gods. You guys remember King David, right? Who remembers King David? All right, all of you. <laughs> so uh, King David was the first king or the second king in Israel, and his son Saul, or Solomon, right after him. But in 930 B.C., which is a long time before Jesus came, uh, Solomon died, and the kingdom split into two kingdoms. Israel in the north had ten tribes, and Judah in the south had two tribes. And from that time, the people really began to rebel against God and his laws and go after other gods, go after the gods of the other peoples around them. But God was very patient uh, with his people and long-suffering, and he continued time and time again to warn them that if they didn't turn from following idols and follow after him, that he would punish them as a nation. And, and they did not listen to the warnings of God through many prophets. And in 721 B.C., again, a long time after David, 700 or uh, 400 years after David, this northern kingdom, because they kept following other gods, they were captured and taken away to Assyria, a land far away, never to return as a, a country. And then in 605 BC, this southern kingdom of Judah is invaded and the captives were taken away to Babylon. And so that's kind of where we get to Daniel. Daniel is one of these captives that's taken away into Babylon. And he was taken away with some of the nobles, which are the smart guys of the land, and the royal family to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. And last week, did you guys learn about King Nebuchadnezzar and his dreams? Yep, I see some hands up there. So King Nebuchadnezzar had Daniel interpret his dreams, and, and he saw how, uh, you see Nebuchadnezzar admitting that God was an all-knowing God. But because, but that didn't convince him that this all-knowing God was all-powerful. And that brings us to our story today. We're going to show God's power, God's plan to rescue. So if you have your Bibles, you already do. Have them uh, open to Daniel 3, and we'll go from there. I'm going to read the first seven verses, and then we'll talk about that. So Daniel 3, starting from verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth was 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that ne King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, and justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image of that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, tigron, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, tigron, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So King Nebuchadnezzar makes this giant statue of himself. It says it's 60 cubits. 
Anybody know how tall 60 cubits is? How do you know that, Dempsey? Um, it's 90 feet. Yes, that's true. So picture this building is probably about 30, 35 feet tall. Maybe it's as high as three times this building. That's how big this statue was that he made. That's, I'd say that's pretty big, right? And he commands that everyone bow down and worship this statue. And if they didn't worship, they'd be thrown into the fiery furnace. So who's all been to a campfire before, out by a campfire? So you know how hot it gets when you get kind of close to the campfire and you can feel it, you know, on your face and you have to move back a little bit. So imagine this furnace being like a giant campfire in a room maybe smaller than this. That's how big this furnace is that these guys are getting thrown into. So, you know, music would start playing and all the people would fall down and worship this giant statue. That's, that sounds kind of crazy, right? Like, you've never seen anything like that happen today. So it's either worship that idol or get burned alive. And, and that could be a pretty tough choice. <laughs> um, but what, what does God say about worshiping other things? Very good. <laughs> we read from his word in Deuteronomy. It says here, Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. So God is saying that he alone is God and he demands all worship. In Exodus 20, uh, verses 1 through 6, that's where we get our Ten Commandments. It says, and God spoke these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Out of the house of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So God is jealous. He does not want to see anybody worshiping anything but him. So the first point we want to see out of this message, we had this golden image, but God is the only God. There is no other God. All other gods, in fact, are not gods at all. And this idol that King Nebuchadnezzar set up was no god at all. So let, let's keep reading and see what happens in this story. We're going to pick up in verse 8. So if you're in Daniel in verse 8, it says, Therefore at that time certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, tigron, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in a furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king Nebuchadnezzar, before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is this true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the tigron, the harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I've made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer it, this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O 
it be. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So these guys are just refusing to worship. These three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they came with Daniel. So they were part of this royal group that would not obey the king's commands. So we see these leaders tell the king that, hey, these guys will not bow down to your statue, which makes the king really upset. And he gives Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego another chance to worship the idol. And even says, if they don't worship, what God can deliver you? Imagine how proud this king was that he doesn't even understand that God is able to deliver. And he is able to rescue. He didn't learn his lesson from last chapter when he had that dream interpreted by God. He didn't understand that God is not only all-knowing, but he is all-powerful. And, and they, so these three guys take a stand. They trust God, and they're obedient to his word. They know that God can deliver them, if he chooses, out of this furnace. And even if he doesn't, they still will not serve or worship other gods. They fully trusted God and were willing to obey him no matter what the result. If they were saved or not, they were going to obey God. So our second point is God, God can be trusted. God can be trusted. So you see, the, these men were confident in God no matter what happened. They wouldn't bow. And Christians today can have the same trust in God no matter what the circumstances Romans 8 says, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height, nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That was Paul writing. And Paul writes at the end of his life in 2 Timothy, But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory and forever. Guys, God can be trusted no matter what the outcome is. It may not be favorable to us, but we can trust that, that God has a plan. And sometimes we may be in a situation where we're called to maybe disobey or, or uh, a direct command from the government or schools or some leader in order to obey God's commands. And at that time, we need to trust God in the situation because God can be trusted. Now, this doesn't mean that you can rebel against your parents or your government. We're called to obey our parents and our government. But if we're ever in a situation where we're called to do something against what God has commanded us to do, we need to obey God rather than men. So let's go back to our story. So, so far we've seen that God is the only God. And God can be trusted. So let's see how the how this story ends. So we're going to read verses 19 through 30. Then Nebuchadnezzar was, was filled with fury. And the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. These men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments. And they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered them, they answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, 
and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not any power over the bodies of those men. The hair on their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire came upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him, and set aside the king's command, and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses laid to ruins. For there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So what we see happening here is this king is so mad that these guys won't bow down, that he has the furnace heated up seven times hotter and some of his best guys his strong men that throw these guys into the fire they get burnt up even throwing them into the fire so remember that campfire that's hot well imagine having to sit so far back because you don't get burnt up in front of it that's how hot this this is a pretty intense fire and these guys are in the fire and it looks like there are now four guys walking around in the middle of the fire And I'm thinking that the king is probably a little bit freaked out by this because he had three guys thrown in and now there's four. So he orders them to come out and listen to how the king orders it. He says, he, he says, servants of the most high God, come here. He's now beginning to recognize that God is all powerful. That this God that these men worshiped was more powerful than him or the idol that he had set up. So he's, re- he's recognizing something miraculous has happened in this fire. He understands that God has saved these guys, which is the third point. Only God can rescue. God has saved these men inside the furnace. And, and we don't know who the fourth person is. It says one like a sh- uh, shining servant of God um, it could have been Jesus, some say. It could have been an angel. We just don't know. The Bible doesn't give us the answer to that. We just know that the Most High God has saved these men. In fact, this was so amazing that not even one hair on their heads was burned. Now, it may look like I've had some hairs on my head burn, but that's not the case. Um, I, that's just the way I am. Uh, but they didn't even have the smell of smoke on them. So they were in a fire. You know how you get around a campfire, you're by your fireplace, and that smoke smell gets on you? They didn't even smell like smoke, and they were inside this fire. They had been rescued because they were faithful to God and his word. And you you hear the king, Nebuchadnezzar answered them and says, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command, And yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any God except their own. He's praising, the king is praising these three guys for not following his command and trusting God. The king goes on to decree that nobody is to even speak against their God. And if they do, those people would be torn limb from limb. So, did this king learn a lesson from throwing these guys into the fire? Did he see that God is the only God? Did he witness that God can be trusted? Did he acknowledge that only God can rescue? Yeah, he he certainly did. In fact, he learned a great lesson that day. And if you guys are going to do chapter 4 next week, he's going to even learn another lesson. Uh, But we're not going to talk about that today. we're going to see what we can take away from, from today's message or from today's story. So there's much more for us to learn here today. You see, 
you and I, we still worship idols today. And you guys might be saying to yourself, there's no way I'm bowing down to statues. Anybody here ever bow down to a statue? I hope not. And, and I, I wouldn't think so. But we still bow down to idols in our hearts. You see, idolatry is not just external. It's not something that you do physically, although it can be. It's internal as well. Whenever we give something more value or worth than God, we are guilty of bowing down to that idol. It could be anything that takes our attention away from God, that if we were to have it taken away, we'd be upset. I mean, think about if you have a favorite sports team, if you couldn't watch them play, or a video game, or if you were into dance and you couldn't go dance, and it would upset you, or even friends, or, or having fun, or anything else more important to you than God. These things are idols of our hearts. In fact, any sin that we commit is idolatry. All sin is idolatry. If you guys listened to Revival from the Bible this week, Pastor Ben said, all sin is idolatry. And some of these things aren't bad. It's not bad to, have, to watch sports or to do dance or to have hobbies. But where we get in trouble is when we let those come between us and God. And they become an idol to us. When we treasure things more than God, it's idolatry. It's sin. Remember, all sin is idolatry. And if we don't turn from our sin and worship God completely... The bad news is there's a much more fiery furnace in store for those who bow down to idols. And it's called hell. And hell is for those who don't worship God completely. And, and that's really bad news. But there is really good news. Remember in our story how only God can rescue. And that still holds true today. God can be trusted to rescue. You see, all of mankind has sinned against God. We have set up idols, object of worship, objects of worship in our own lives. We have clearly broken God's commands and deserve God's punishment and his wrath. But God created a great rescue plan. He sent his son Jesus into the world to live a perfect life without sin. Jesus obeyed all of God's commands perfectly and then paid the penalty for sin by dying on the cross, which satisfied God's wrath. And then he rose again, showing his victory over death. If we believe that Jesus died and paid the penalty for our sins and repent from our sins and follow him, then we too can be rescued. God alone still rescues today. And wants to rescue you. No matter how good you are or think you're acting, you're not good enough to rescue yourself from your sins. If you've not trusted that Jesus has paid the penalty for your sins, then you're still under God's wrath for sin. And that fiery furnace is awaiting. If this is you, I would beg you to repent today. And obey God and turn and follow Jesus. Look at the idols that are in your lives. Leave those idols and worship God alone. And, and if, if you're here and you're already trusting in Jesus for rescue, I would ask to take a look at yourself. See if you have any things in your life that are becoming more important than God. And turn from those and seek God wholly. We can learn a lot from this lesson today. You know, it's not just a story. It paints a picture of how life will be in eternity. If you set up this idol in your heart and worship it, that's what you have to look forward to is this, this fireiness. But if, if you repent and turn and, and turn to God, you have this rescue. So take this home today. Think about these idols that you may have and live this out. Just trust in God for his rescue. Uh, let me pray.